We use a variety of woods for various reasons. Tone really is number one. Stability and aesthetic certainly have to be considered, but the great thing with the Les Paul, you know, that was this first time there was a hybrid of a mahogany back with a maple top, and it just created a sound unlike anything else. Gibson has always been the leading edge of innovation. If you always do the same thing, then you don't, you don't make any advances. The wood that we use for the neck is dimensionally sized so it's closer to the finished form. That way we ensure that we have perfect clarity and grain orientation. Everything has to be quarter sawn. We'll get that wood, we'll have to unstack it and then restack it with the stickers so then we can equilibrate it in the kilns and get that air circulation. On our necks, we'll use a, a 12 quarter neck blank. However, with the width of our headstock, we glue on what are called ears. That way, uh, it's, it's more sustainable for the wood. It's more environmentally conscious, and you don't have to needlessly waste as much wood to yield the neck. When we machine a neck, it initially starts out on our rotary profiler, which is an old school chain-driven shaper table, actually. It'll rotate circular around those cutters, and then at each station, an operator will rotate it in the fixture so it does different operations. We've done that in several areas where we've introduced machinery, and it's not really to take away from the craftsmanship, it's more to make the consistency there so that the craftsmen aren't spending so much of their time trying to get the basic shape and stuff done. The truss rod is a great story in itself. It's a Gibson invention. Gibson invented the truss rod in 1921. It's basically a bolt that runs the span of the neck. So it's inserted in a slot in the neck, and then there's a, a maple spline, which is a piece of wood that holds it captive with a, a slight arc. So when the neck undergoes tension and pulls forward, you tighten that truss rod and it'll want to straighten itself out. It not only does it allow adjustment of the neck, it also allows us to make a neck thinner. When people like Charlie Christian and the early electric pioneers started having these guitars equipped with pickups, they also had thinner necks. And that thinner neck allowed them to play farther up the neck. So without that slim neck and the pickup, you know, history would be very different. In the case of necks, we use locator holes on the neck blank so fingerboards can locate and align properly on the neck blank. And then all the various operations for machining and processing the neck has a reference or a witness point on that component. So a neck will have its locator holes, a fingerboard has its matching locator holes, and then right before they're joined, we install dowel pins and that locates that fingerboard onto the neck to ensure that scale is accurate and that the fingerboard is positioned appropriately on that neck. Other tasks that are done at the neckline in the rough mill include gang drilling of the headstock hole. So instead of drilling each tuner hole one at a time, we'll have gang drill. So that'll drill six tuner holes all at one time. We also machine the headstock closer to, it, to its final profile and pitch and prepare it for you know, later finishing here at this plant. It, it's still very exciting for me. You know, I walk in the Gibson building and I see the Gibson logo you know, at the entrance. This is my 40th year of doing this in the guitar business. My very, very first guitar was a Gibson. It's surreal that I'm here. I would have never dreamed of being here when I received my first guitar. I've been here 37 years. That's over half my life I've spent at this facility. I've always kind of taken it personal. I, lo I look at Gibson like it belongs to me.